hands together for the Lord. Amen. Uh, 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 that, 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 that didn't satisfy me, but can we put our hands together for the Lord? Has God been good to anybody? He woke us up this morning, started us on our way, gave us a portion of our health and strength, and led us here to Wilmington to our 155th session of the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. He is worthy to be praised. And I'm going to ask you one more time, like you mean it. If God has been good to you, come on and get on your feet and give God some praise in this house on tonight. Amen. We're going to ask Dr. Tiffany Cornelius Bennett to come and lead us in our praise and worship. And after she completes our praise and worship, we will hear from the pastor of the First Missionary Baptist Church of Carthage, North Carolina, none other than Reverend John Fuller, Jr. Amen. I'm still here, saying I am still here, and it's by the grace of God. How many of you 
you are glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time are you glad to be in the presence of the Lord you should have brought the Lord with you take the Lord with you everywhere you go and you're still here there's some of us who didn't make it didn't make it but the Lord spared our lives and right now we need to give God praise we need to give God praise because it's by the grace of God that we are still here still here and it's by the grace of God oh, yeah. I am still here it's by the grace of God put glad hands together put glad hands together if you're still fighting for the Lord still you're a soldier. You're a soldier in the army of the Lord. Hallelujah. Put those hands together. Stand if you are able. This is not a spectator event. This is worship. Worship and praise. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. So God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. 
up this morning, started you on your way, gave you food to eat, gave you life and health, gave you health and strength. Praise the Lord. Lord. Don't just say it to somebody else. Say it to yourself. Praise the Lord. Why? Because he's been so good. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. That's why we've got to bless the Lord with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our heart. Bless his holy name. Bless him with everything that you've got. Let everything, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, bless the Lord. Come on, open up, everybody. Yeah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, my Sing it one more time. pray. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on us. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. The living God. Lord fall fresh now Lord upon us. Father God is once and again 
you've allowed us one more opportunity to assemble together one more time. Lord, we're here in Wilmington, North Carolina, Lord. Lord, here on Monday evening, Lord. You're the, the, the year of 20 and 22. And Father God, we just come to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being so kind. Thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for just being so good. Now, Lord, we've come to this words of experience. Lord, I ask now that you decrease the messenger. Lord, as the message goes forth, because I realize that it's not about me, but it's all about you. May you be edified. May you be glorified. May you be magnified. May the devil be horrified. And may all God's people be satisfied. This is our prayer. And all God's people shout with me, amen. Uh, come on, amen and amen. Can we give God some praise in this place? For certainly he is worthy to be praised. Uh, the Bible says from the rising of the sun uh, to the going down of the same, he is worthy to be praised. First of all, give me an honor to the almighty God, who's the author of my life, he's the sculptor of my soul. General Baptist, he is my all in all. I, 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 excuse me. I, I, mm. I do greet you all in the master's name of Jesus. Because as my late father would say, y'all, it's good to be here. I, I say it is good to be here. To our most esteemed president, Dr. Leonzo Lynch, Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your leadership, but most of all, thank you for your friendship. Amen. Many of you don't know, Dr. Lynch was, uh, has been calling me for many, many years. Amen. And he calls me about once a week just to check up on little old me. And that means so much to me, Dr. Lynch. To our vice president at large, Dr. Ricky Banks, to our first vice president, Dr. J. Vincent Terry, second vice president, Dr. O.D. Sykes, third vice president, Dr. Prince Randy Rivers, and to our fourth vice president, Dr. Reginald A. Wells, to our executive, uh, to our executive uh, secretary treasurer, Dr. Tony Barr, to all the auxiliaries that comprise this great General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina Incorporated, to the shepherd of this house, Dr. Terry Henry, thank you so much for allowing me to stand where you stand every Sunday. Amen. Amen. To our presider, Dr. Uh, Whitehead, thank you so much. To everybody that's somebody. Amen. Now that I cover everybody, amen. 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 But allow me to acknowledge my moderator from the Deep River of Missionary Baptist Association, Dr. Cicero Summers, to all the churches that comprise the Deep River Association, thank y'all so much for your support. Amen. The book of Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. A very familiar passage of scripture. Now the president told me to take my time, amen. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. very familiar passage of scripture where you find these words hast thou not known hast thou not heard that the everlasting God the Lord the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not neither is weary there is no searching of his understanding he giveth power to the faint Yes, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Yes, even the youth shall faint and be weary. Yes, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Ah, they shall walk and not faint. 
y'all allow me for just a little while for the time that is ours to talk from this subject staying on course with God staying on course with God when Winston Churchill was prime minister there in Great Britain he endured some difficult moments his wife hoping to uh, comfort him suggested that all of his worries were just a blessing in disguise to which uh, Churchill replied that if it be so then the blessing is very well disguised have you ever felt like that so if not uh, so if not uh, just keep living and my brothers and my sisters a life will hand you some why moments yes these are some challenging times for all of us dealing with this coronavirus monkeypox racism hatred and mass shootings uh, just to name a few but honestly uh dr cicero summers these things should never be be a surprise uh, to the body of christ because he forewarned us uh, right there in john 6 uh, john 16 verse 33 that in this life uh, you will have some tribulations Now, Forrest Gump said it best, y'all. That life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Truth is, Ray Murphy, that one day you're moving on up like the Jeffersons. But then the next day you're trying to survive like the Evans family. Can I get a witness in here? So in the text, we find that the prophecy of Isaiah that it's divided uh, right there into two major sections. Chapters 1 through 39, they deal with God's judgment. Chapters 40 through 66, a uh, deal with God's future deliverance. But the latter section deals with Jerusalem being overthrown. Judas' armies defeated and the people find themselves in bondage. But here it is in this peril. They are asking God, God, where are you? But how many of us know that God always has a plan? God's ways are not our ways, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. God's going to do, God's going to do what he wants to, how he wants to, when he wants to, where he wants to. Truth is that all of us just have to trust in the process. So he sent the prophet uh, with a new message of assurance that God is still in charge. But Isaiah asked the people in verse 27, Dr. Henry, why are you acting this way? Why are you mumbling? Why are you grumbling? Why are you complaining? Why are you doubting our God? Why are you talking this way? Why are you feeling like God is hiding from us? Yeah. But I imagine that Isaiah said, now look y'all, y'all better recognize, y'all better come to your senses. Yeah. Then in verse 28, he had to remind them, have you not heard? Have you not known? Don't you know who our God is? Isaiah had to let them know that what I'm saying is not new. Because you've all seen the works of our God. He said God has not forsaken us. But it seems like we've forsaken God. Now, God's timing is perfect. He does nothing out of order. Y'all know God does everything decent and in amen. So in other words, God is sovereign. I say God is sovereign, y'all. Now, the old church, they used to sing that you can't hurry God. 
You just have to wait. Trust and give him time. No matter how long it takes. He's a God that you can't hurry. You don't have to worry. He may not come when you want him. But you know about this, I'm a witness that he's always on time. Now God doesn't faint, nor does he get weary. So when you tried everything else, yes, when you tried everything else, can I suggest to try God today? But not only try him, but stay with him. Psalm 9, verse 9 through 10 states that the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. He's a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Y'all, in other words, whatever we're going through, God is always in charge. There's an old spiritual that says that God never fails. God never fails. He abides in me. He gives me victory. For God never fails. So just keep the faith. Yes, and never cease to pray. Walk upright. Call it morning, noon, day, or night. He said he'd be there. There's no need to worry. For God, he never fails. Now, if I can testify, May the 26th of 2019 was a dark day in my life. That was a day, that was the day my father, he transitioned from earth to glory while being at Duke Hospital. Here it was, I was at First Missionary in Carthage preaching. My brother was at Progressive in Fayetteville preaching. My brother-in-law and sister were at First Baptist Turkey. Uh -huh. So word came from my oldest niece that they needed to see the family and right there at Duke. So I journeyed there to Duke, contemplating what was going on. So after a little while, their family and others were called into the conference room where we were informed that our father had passed at 1 p.m. Now I won't lie and say that I wasn't in disbelief, that I wasn't in shock, that I was not hurt. Because you see, my father was my pastor. He was my mentor and my hero. Uh, so after uh, digesting what had occurred, I, I, I actually picked myself up, trying to be strong, trying to hold in the tears, trying to suppress the pain. But Dr. Henry, uh, was finally, uh, when I got in my car, right there in the parking the garage at Duke Hospital, the tears started flowing from my eyes. And y'all, I question God. I asked God, why did you take my father? And General Baptist, before God could answer, before God could answer, Red Maduga, I heard my father say to me, so son, now, the same God that you preach about Sunday after Sunday, that has all power. The same God that woke you up this morning. The same God that started you on your way. Y'all, I can hear my father saying to me, so now, son, here it is, you're not trusting in God. Y'all, the tears started flowing more freely from my eyes. But not because I was sad. But I was rejoicing that God never makes a mistake. That God has all power. 
<laughs> Y'all, I said he has all power in his hands. That God has it all in control. Uh, yes, he does. Well, General Baptist, as I close, yes, I'm glad to report tonight that God is still in charge. Yes, I'm glad to report that he's still on the throne. Yes, I'm glad to report that he sits high. Yes, and he looks low. Glad to report that trouble don't last always. Uh, so if we know all of this, yes, about our God, then we ought to take comfort in these words. Uh, what the hymnist said, ah, to be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. I beneath his wings of love abide. God will, God will, God will, God will take care of you. Y'all forgive me, I feel my daddy, I'm sorry, amen. God will take care of you. Stay on course, stay on course with God and God will take care of you. Can the church say amen? amen? Come on, put your hands together for the message as well as the messenger. Amen. God will take care of us. God, as we again have gathered here in this session, we pray now and ask God and we thank you for already manifesting your spirit. We want to invite you here because you're already here. But God, while you're here, touch somebody's heart tonight. Bless somebody's heart. Deliver them from their condition that they come with tonight. And God, just bless us all individually as one body. And then bless us as we prepare to go back to our individual places. You know what we stand in need of. So God, have your way tonight. Bless this preacher who preached out of his heart. Restore him. Replenish him. Renew his spirit and his faith. God, we just ask you to have your way tonight. So as we enter into this second part of worship, let your Holy Spirit reign and rule supreme. And we'll do all we can to do to worship you and exalt you and exhort you because you are worthy to be praised. Thank you, God. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to ask Reverend Dr. Katrina Futrell, who is a candidate for fourth vice president of our Women's Auxiliary, to come with the scripture following moderator Preston Harris of the Trent River Oakey Grove Missionary Baptist Association, candidate for parliamentarian, to come with our evening prayer.
protocol has already been established, so let me greet you this way. God's good evening, beautiful people of General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. Is that all right? Amen. Our scripture reading this afternoon will come from the 24th Psalm. If you can rise to your feet, if you don't mind, and if you can't, that's all right too. God's not mad about it. I'll be reading from the King James Version, and the word of God reads from Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath found it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lift up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in his presence. As we bow our heads, eternal God, our Father, creator of heaven and earth, one who made us, we acknowledge that thou art God and above you, there is none other. We come before thee as humbly as we know how, acknowledging, Lord, that you have brought us to this, a brand new day, a day that you have made, allowing us to be here in this 100 55th session of the General Baptist State Convention. We are thankful, Lord, that you have brought us from far and near. Even though we are going through various trials and tribulations and various pestilence and circumstances, but Lord, you're still God and you enabled us to be here. We pray for your blessing upon this great convention as we have come together we pray for the officers. We pray for all of the messengers, for all who have come to celebrate in this great fellowship. We ask the Lord to bless those who would be on to preach the gospel, those who would deliver workshops, those who would sing, those who would stand in ushering, those who would do all the things to lift up the name Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us, anoint us afresh, that the things we do and say would edify your name, that, Lord, you might be glorified in everything that we do and say. Bless the manservant who would come forth, that we know that the word is not just for individuals, but it's for everyone who allows themselves to be used by the Spirit of God. We ask you, Lord, to bless us in a mighty way. For we know, Lord, you have everything we need, a storehouse that never runs short of anything. We know your word going forth won't return into you void, but it will accomplish all that it was set out to do. Have thine own way, let thy will be done. And we will forever give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. It shall be thine. In the mighty name, Jesus, we pray. And we thank you, Lord. Amen.
this time, we're going to ask Dr. William T. Newkirk to come and do our offertory appeal for state missions for the evening. And he will do the prayer. To President Lynch, our presiding officer, Reverend Whitehead, all of our vice presidents and other officers of our convention, to Dr. Barr, Pastor Henry, to all the pastors, moderators, messengers of this great convention, good evening. In October 1867, our convention was formed at the First African Baptist Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Though it was different back then, it had a different name, its focus was the same as it is now, to support the gospel ministry and to promote missions. I know our focus has expanded over the years, but it still has that as the premise, the basic premise, to support the gospel ministry and to promote missions. Missions define who we are and what we do. It's done through state missions here in North Carolina and foreign missions through Lock Carey. We can't do that without resources, human resources and financial resources. We come appealing to you tonight to help us fulfill the main focus of our convention by giving during this special offering for state missions. What about state missions? Think about this. You can have a shiny new car that's perfect on the outside with a beautiful interior on the inside some brand new gangster white wall tires <laughs> underneath. But if there's no engine in that car, that car cannot move forward. That car cannot carry anyone anywhere. And that car cannot exert any power. That car is no earthly good to anybody. State missions is the engine of our General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina Incorporated. I appeal to you tonight, let us keep that engine running. We ask that you will make a check out to GBSC of North Carolina or NC. I appeal that we use the QR code in our program on each page in the bottom corner of the page. I appeal to those who are live streaming to look at the screen whenever we begin the offering, and you'll see five different ways to give. I appeal to all leaders of our convention, all pastors and leaders, if you will, make a sacrifice. Let us give a minimum of $50, $50 leaders. All others, how about $25? Let's sacrifice. Make a check out. Tonight, I brought another check from our church when I was asked to do this. First, my $50, but I have a check for $3,000 for our state missions, in addition to the $5,000 we've already given. And another $1,000 for foreign mission, in addition to the $1,000 we've already given. Oak City Baptist Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. But let us sacrifice tonight. Someone once said, no one ever became poor by giving. Think about that. Nobody ever came poor by giving. Someone else said, don't give until it hurts. Instead, give until it feels good. Stand with me, please, as we have our offertory prayer.
We have $100 that's being given in honor of Dr. John Fuller Sr. by uh, Dr. John Fuller Jr. in honor of his dad. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to give. Thank you for how you have blessed us and kept us. Thank you for our great convention that's doing a great work. And thank you for allowing us to be the hands and feet that will help us to, help us to continue to do in the work. Help us to give, oh God, out of our abundant resources you've blessed us with. Bless all of those on live streaming tonight as they give. And Lord, use these resources to bless others. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. As the ushers will take charge and come and give us directions on how we're going to receive the offering. You say we're going to walk. Okay. Um, let us stand. And while the ushers are coming, we're going to hear a musical selection from our choir. And after that musical selection from our choir, we're going to um, come back with further instructions.
things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. seated. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask that our director of music, Dr. Tiffany Bennett Cornelius, to come and present this great choir. Let's put our hands together for them. Amen. I was supposed to call them earlier in the program, but um, I asked them to charge it to my head and not my heart. Forgiven. Amen. <laughs> Tonight we have some very, very, very special guests. In 1984, members of the former Williston High School Glee Club, Glee Club organized an alumni group under the name of Williston Alumni Choral Ensemble, directed by Mrs. B. Constance Odell, who was the music teacher and choral director at the time when Williston High School was closed. The original ensemble consisted of Glee Club members who were graduates of Williston Industrial School under the direction of Mr. James Thompson and Williston Senior High School with graduates ranging from the class of 1944 to the last graduating class of 1968. The choir extended its membership to include other alumni and interested singers in Wilmington and the surrounding areas. Ms. Marva Robinson is the current director with accompanist Mrs. Monty Swepson and gospel music director Mr. Cornelius Hamilton. This year the choir will perform at the second annual commemoration of the United States Colored Troops sculpture at Cameron Art Museum on Sunday, November 13th, 2022 at 2 o'clock p.m. Also, the choir will present its Christmas concert at Union Missionary Baptist Church on Sunday, December the 11th at 4 o'clock p.m. Dr. Terry, I want to thank you for always knowing everybody in Wilmington. It is through him that I have met these great people, and it is through him that we were able to secure this choir. General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina Incorporated, please help me and give a warm welcome to the Williston Alumni Community Choir. Jesus! 
Jesus will be mine to see what the end will be. Dawn made my vow to the Lord, and I never will turn back. Oh, I will go, I shall go, to see what the end will be. what the end will be. Dun, dun, made my vow to the Lord. Dun, dun, made my vow to the Lord. Dun, dun, made my vow to the Lord to see what the end will be. What the end will be. Dun, dun, made my vow to the Lord. Dun, dun, made my vow to the Lord. The end will be what the end will be. Done the Lord. Done the Lord. Done the Lord. Done the Lord. To see what the end will be. Rides on a milk white horse, no man works like him. The river of Jordan he did cross, no man works like him, for he is king of kings, Lord of lords. Oh, Jesus Christ, the first and last. Oh, King Jesus rides in the middle of the air. Oh, he calls the saints from everywhere. Oh.
At this time, we're going to ask Reverend Earl Thorpe to come from the Minister's Missionary and Benefits Board. And following him, we have Ms. Amanda Tyler from Christian Nationalism. Then we will have a be blessed with a solo before the objective spotlight. Grace and peace be unto you from God, our heavenly parent, spirit of the living God, Jesus Christ, our savior. I bring you greetings from MMBB and our CEO, Louis Barber. For those of you who do not know who MMB is, we are the premier financial services ministry, and that is the correct terminology, financial service ministry and partner with the GBSC and C. It is wonderful to be in this great congregation of saints. And I want to implore you just for a brief few moments, while we may be filled with the Holy Spirit every day of the week, while we may go to church and serve the people of God, while we may come to these conventions and learn all that we need to learn and vote, we need to take a moment to think about us saving. We need to learn how we as a congregation of preachers and church workers and the body of Christ needs to save for our retirement so that we can retire with dignity. It's not just me saying this because I am a pastor. It's not just me saying this because I've seen what uh, COVID has done. It's not me just saying this because I know that there's some pastors who wish they could retire, but they can't because there's nothing to retire to. It's none of that. It's because we believe that those who have done the work and are doing the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ should be honored by the church to retire with dignity. If you're not thinking about your retirement yet, start. And if you think it's too late, it's never too late to start thinking about your retirement. Now I know we can shout, I know we can dance, we hear a joyful noise from the Lord, not an awful noise from the Lord, but if you leave here and you don't do anything differently than when you came, particularly when it comes to your church and your church circumstances, well, you're just wasting your time. Because when it's all said and done, and everything is done and said, we don't want you at the time of your transition that your wife is trying to jump into the casket with you. We don't want when you are thinking about retirement and you're looking at your savings and there's nothing there that you say, well, I better try to call my friends and see if I can preach a little longer. We don't want you having any regrets about the ministry of Jesus Christ because the church and your family and this great congregation did not tell you that there is a plan for you at MNBB. So while we may want to shout, and we should shout, I'll be right there with you. We'll be here for the next day or so, bringing you greetings, and I'll be right out there. You want to talk about your retirement? Come see me. You want to start your retirement? Come see me. And if you can't remember Reverend Earl Thorpe, just remember it, mmbb.org. God bless you. Well, good evening, General Baptists. <laughs> President Lynch, Executive Secretary Treasurer Barr, Host Pastor Dr. Henry, thank you for your gracious invitation for me to bring you greetings tonight and share about our work fighting white Christian nationalism. I'm Amanda Tyler. I'm executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, or BJC for short. Now, disclaimer, I am not a preacher. I am a lawyer. 
uh, but I will keep my comments brief so you can get back to this incredible preaching and music. I'm here to bring you greetings from our staff on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by BJC Board Chair, the Reverend Dr. Lynn Brinkley. In case you're learning about BJC for the first time tonight, I will give you a very brief description of our work. BJC is an 86-year-old education and advocacy organization that draws on the best of our Baptist tradition of soul freedom and religious freedom to fight for the faith freedom of all of our neighbors. We are urged on in this work by the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, that nobody's free until everybody's free. And in doing so, we try to stay true to the prophetic words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr that the church is not to be the master or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. Well, some of our work is done directly on Capitol Hill with briefs to the United States Supreme Court and legislative advocacy with Congress. But more and more, our work is taking place across the country in educating groups of Baptists and others and equipping them to take action on behalf of their neighbor's faith freedom. And over the last three years, BJC has organized and led the Christians Against Christian Nationalism movement. We are a growing movement for Christians and others who want to take a stand against this poisonous ideology and offer an alternative Christian witness for the world. We equip individuals to have the tough but necessary conversations in their communities, churches and congregations about how white Christian nationalism threatens our faith and our country. We have a library of resources, including podcast series, webinars, discussion guides and one page explainers at our website, ChristiansAgainstChristianNationalism.org. On that website, you can also find a statement that you all can sign as Christians Against Christian Nationalism. We've worked with religious and non-religious groups and individuals to draw attention to the urgent threat of white Christian nationalism including how it worked to unite the insurrectionists at the Capitol and intensify their attack on democracy itself. I believe that white Christian nationalism is the single biggest threat to religious freedom today in our country. And that the only way to dismantle it will be a national recommitment to the foundational values of religious freedom for all. Christian nationalism is a political ideology and a cultural framework that tries to merge the identities of Americans and Christians. It suggests that to be a true American, one must be Christian and one must be white. But the Christian in Christian nationalism is more about identity than it is about religion. It carries with it all sorts of baked in coded references to authoritarianism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and militarism. And it relies on a false myth of the founding of America as a Christian nation, a glorified and fictional accounting of the past that sanctifies the founders and sacralizes our founding documents. Christian nationalism often overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. And it creates and perpetuates a sense of cultural belonging that is limited to the people who were included in the founding period, namely native born white Christians. White Christian nationalism threatens democracy because it creates in-groups and out-groups, 
It cultivates and perpetuates a harmful us versus them ideology that can lead to deadly violence. We have far too many examples of how white Christian nationalism has led violent extremists to kill their neighbors in the name of God. We think of the victims at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, at a Walmart in El Paso, and at the top supermarket in Buffalo, all in our recent memory. We also recognize that white Christian nationalism harms our faithful walk with Jesus as it replaces his gospel of love with the false idol of power. It confuses political authority with religious authority and in doing so leads us to compromise our religious convictions in deference to the preferences of the politically powerful. It uses and abuses the name of Jesus to prop up injustice and racism. So to fight against Christian nationalism, we will need to tap into our power of dissent. Dissent, after all, is in the Baptist DNA. In the responses to threats to our freedom today, I see people standing up for their neighbors like never before. I see people and hear people asking me, what can we do about white Christian nationalism? And so when our communities need us the most, we can be a witness for our faith, drawing on the best of our tradition, our understanding that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, and that we are to use our freedom, not in our own self-interest, but in service to love our neighbor. And that includes the freedom to dissent, to protest, to say that this is not right and we can do something about it. I find hope and inspiration in listening to how others have responded when their freedoms have been stripped away. We at BJC know that religious freedom has been, as James Baldwin put it, white too long. Far too often, an American understanding of religious freedom has centered a white perspective to the exclusion of others and the, to the detriment of all of our call to freedom. And so we must be intentional about listening to and learning from people of many backgrounds, identities, and experiences. We know that this act of inclusion and intentional listening will lead to a broader and more complete understanding of and defense of freedom itself. We listen to and learn from each other about how freedom has been threatened, how at times we ourselves have been the oppressors, and how we can work to be liberators for our neighbors today. So I invite you tonight to join with us at BJC and at Christians Against Christian Nationalism. You can learn more about our work at two websites, bjconline.org and christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. I invite you to see our resources, share them, and engage with us. Thank you, General Baptist State Convention, for your prophetic witness in this world and for your partnership in this important fight against white Christian nationalism and our fight for freedom. Thank you. This time we'll have a solo. Okay. Well, we're going to have our objective spotlight um, video.
Well, grace and peace be to you from God and from our liberating Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. To President Leonzo Lynch, to your Executive Secretary Treasurer, Dr. Tony Barr and Lot Carey board member, and to the host pastor, Dr. Terry Henry. I am sending this video on behalf of our Chairman of the Board, Dr. John Alexander, the Lot Carey Board of Directors, our first Vice President, Dr. Jesse Williams, second Vice President, Dr. James Victor, and the Lot Carey family to extend greetings as you gather for your 155th annual session of the General Baptist State Convention. We celebrate your work as the oldest black association in North Carolina, and we are grateful for your partnership and support of Lot Carey. I must say that your liberal and generous support helps and has helped Lot Carey to fulfill its missions as a global missions agency committed to transforming lives with the love of Jesus Christ. I must say that since stepping into this role as president of Lot Carey, I cannot remember a time that a call to action has been issued and that this convention, along with your executive secretary treasurer, treasurer Dr. Tony Barr, has not come to our rescue and responded to our call to action in tangible ways that have helped us to be the organization that God has called us to be for these times. It is my prayer that your time together will be fruitful and that the Spirit of God will breathe on you as you spend time in discernment, in reflection, in worship, and in instruction, seeking solutions and strategies to be repurposed for ministry, which is your conference theme. And may the Lord forever bless and keep you, is my prayer. President of the General Baptist State Convention, Dr. Lynch, and all of the convention leadership, all pastors, ministers, sisters, and brothers in Christ. I am Angela Williams, and on behalf of the children's staff and board of directors, it is my pleasure to bring you greetings from the Central Children's Home of North Carolina, where I serve as executive director and Theodore C. Edwards serves as president of the board of directors. Thank you for the opportunity to bring greetings from the Central Children's Home. First, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your support of the Central Children's Home. Your continued support and commitment continue to make a tremendous difference in our efforts to care for children. We are extremely grateful for the contributions and support from the General Baptist State Convention. In 2021, the General Baptist State Convention contributed $59,672. And thus far in 2022, we have received contributions of $65,050. Your contributions and support have been a wonderful blessing to the Central Children's Home. The past couple of years have been a very challenging time for us since the start of the pandemic. In addition to COVID, we are still experiencing a decline in our donations and a higher staff vacancy than usual. We have also been affected by higher personnel costs due to staff vacancies. However, we have some very dedicated staff and I appreciate them so very much. Just a few updates since the mid-year session. We recently launched our new website. Our campus is open to visitors with COVID protocols in place. However, we are not allowing visitors inside the cottages where the children reside. We are making plans to resume our Central Children's Home Day in June of 2023. We continue to solicit your prayers and support for the Central Children's Home. Please keep the children's staff and board of directors lifted in prayer as we continue to serve and make a positive difference in the lives of the children in our care. Also, please continue to lift our stakeholders and all of those who desire to partner with us to positively impact our children in prayer. Dr. Lynch, thank you for your service and the leadership of the General Baptist State Convention. I pray you will have a wonderful and harmonious session and may God continue to bless each of you. As the 18th president of Shaw University, it is indeed an honor and a privilege 
to bring greetings on behalf of the Board of Trustees, administration, faculty, staff, and students to the 155th annual session of the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. I am enthralled by the mission or theme of the annual session, repurposed for ministry. Because I believe that what the General Baptist State Convention has done for Shaw University is allow it to continuously reinvest in its mission of service to its students and the community at large, made possible by your support. I know that it will be an informative, uh, exciting annual session, and I look forward to hearing the outcome and to be a part of the continuous engagement of the General Baptist State Convention with Shaw University. Thank you so much and God bless. The General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina, Reverend Dr. Leonzo Lynch. Thank you, my beloved. It is preaching time. I am blessed to have first met and heard Dr. Wayne Croft while I was visiting and preaching in Philadelphia for a son of North Carolina, Reverend Patrick Cheston. And Reverend Cheston called and was able to let me know he's going to be with us this week. He came down for the session, a son of North Carolina. So since I met Dr. Croft through Reverend Cheston, I'm going to ask Reverend Cheston to come and present Dr. Croft. Amen. Reverend Patrick L. Cheston, Amen. let's welcome our son home. Amen. Good evening, General Baptist. I said, good evening, General Baptist. It's preaching time. It's good to be back home. I am a product of Greensboro, North Carolina. In fact, I actually spent a lot of time across this state I finished up my military service at the Marine Corps Air Station, New River, just a few miles up the road, just outside of Jacksonville, North Carolina. So it's good to be back in this familiar ground. You didn't come to hear me. I drove eight hours to hear this man. I said, I drove eight hours to hear this man. There's a lot that could be said about Dr. Wayne E. Croft. As a matter of fact, I could take up a lot of time just on the little bit I know and I am sure there's so much more left. Philadelphia is a very blessed city. The, the founding of our nation took place in Philadelphia. The ringing of freedom took place in Philadelphia. Though debatable, the actual signing of the independence of our documenting as a nation took place in Philadelphia. Will Chamberlain took place in Philadelphia. Allen Iverson, the answer for every question you may have on the court took place in Philadelphia. He may not own it, though he says he's from Lower Marion. Kobe Bryant <laughs> came from the area of Philadelphia. There's a many of things. In fact, if you've been paying attention to the news, if you've been paying attention to anything that's going on in the world of sports, you know that anybody who's winning is coming from Philadelphia. Let me help you if you don't already know. Just happened last night, the Philadelphia Phillies are going to the World Series. And the only undefeated team in the NFL, NFL, NFC East, is the Philadelphia Eagles. I know some of y'all see stars, but we'll pray for your hope. 
but a lot of great things come from Philadelphia, moving from the sports arena inside the sanctuary. There's some great personalities in Philadelphia area. Our former president, President Emeritus of National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated, Dr. William J. Shaw has been at White Rock for over 60 years in Philadelphia. Great voice of Hampton, Dr. J. Wendell Mampson, who celebrates more than 20 years at Monumental Baptist Church in Philadelphia. But Philadelphia is not just a kept secret. There are some things that happen in Philly, the Church of the Redeemer in Philadelphia, Church of Redeemer Baptist in Philadelphia, gave way to the rise of this man who was a great kept secret in Philadelphia, but has broadened his horizons beyond Philadelphia to perhaps the wealthier side of things, moved on up to the west side. And in some cities, west side doesn't necessarily mean affluence. It may mean some concern. But Westchester, Pennsylvania, just about an hour or less outside of Philadelphia, depending on your route, the traffic, and how fast you may drive, is a best blessed area because they call this man their pastor. He's a seminary tenured professor where he has an endowed chair, the Jeremiah Wright Professorship at the esteemed, on the rise, United Lutheran Seminary in Philadelphia. There's a lot of things. He's married to a wonderful woman, got wonderful children. And I don't know if you go to Hampton, if you've ever been to Hampton, especially prior to the experience of our pandemic, you heard this man lecture. Well, started off lecturing. And it made our souls happy right there on the campus of the University by the Sea at Hampton University. There's so much to be said, but guess what? I'm going to shut up because coming from the road near Philadelphia is a preaching man, a man who knows the gospel, who has studied the gospel, who teaches the gospel, and more importantly, examines and exemplifies the gospel. So to President Lynch, to the vice presidents of this General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina Incorporated, to the staff and to the leadership, Dr. Tony Barr, to the cabinet of the parent body, to the auxiliary presidents and their leadership, to the pastors and moderators, to this host pastor, Pastor Terry. It's my privilege to come eight hours down this road to be right here in Wilmington with Pastor Henry, pastors and preachers at Macedonia to present to some and introduce to others my friend, this preacher tonight. You have not heard him, you'll never forget him the Reverend Doctor, twice, Wayne E. Croft, hear ye him.
Welcome the Reverend Dr. Wayne Croft. Dr. Croft has distinguished himself as a pastor, writer, and scholar. He is the first person to earn both a Master of Philosophy and a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Drew University. He has contributed to various publications and has served as Dean of the Pennsylvania Eastern Keystone Baptist Association and as the Assistant Professor of Homiletics and Liturgics at Palmer Theological Seminary of Eastern University in Philadelphia. He now serves as the Jeremiah A. Wright Senior Professor of Homiletics and Liturgics in African American Studies at United Lutheran Seminary in Pennsylvania. Dr. Croft serves as pastor of St. Paul's Baptist Church in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Wayne Croft. Well, this is the day the Lord has made, and we can rejoice and be glad in it. We do give honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, who is alive and well. And to you, my brothers and sisters who are related to me by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's good to be here. I give honor to our president, the Reverend Dr. Leonzo Lynch, to the vice presidents of this great convention and board and the executive secretary and treasurer, my good friend Tony Barr, and to all of you, to this little group right here, Anthonette, Robert, Charles, Scott, Chris, good to see you all, and so many other great friends. My minister of music was here somewhere. I don't know where he went. Oh, he's on Oregon, all right. I'm glad to have him here with me. Thank you, Dr. Lynch, for allowing me to come and share um, with you on this, your convention, and and I'm honored. I'm not used to two introductions, so I feel very honored uh, to be here and thank God for my good friend, Reverend Patrick Cheston. Um, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, uh, the Eagles are doing well. They're doing well. But I, I am a Cowboys fan. Because the Bible says the wise men follow the star. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Cheston, for, for such a wonderful introduction. When John Smith, considered the founder of the Baptist faith, became a part of the separatist movement, he separated himself from the Church of England, which made it be called the separatist movement. 
he became a part of the General Baptists. There were two different Baptists. There were particular Baptists and there were General Baptists. The particular Baptists followed John Calvin and that there are those who are predestined, elected to be a part of the faith. The General Baptist said, whosoever will, let them come. I'm glad I'm with the General Baptist tonight because I'm a part of whosoever will, let them come. So I thank you and I give God glory and honor for you. I want to share with you from the Gospel of Matthew, the 11th chapter, the second verse to the sixth verse. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And he said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or do we look for or wait for another? I want to talk about when the preacher has doubts. When the preacher has doubts. There is no doubt that we all have our struggles with doubt. The negative effects of doubt often raises its ugly head when our faith is under pressure. It is then that we are most vulnerable to doubt. The anxieties about life, security, and status can easily cause us to doubt and encroach on our relationship with God. Lawrence De Armani in his article, 1988 article in Discipleship Journal says that we are most vulnerable to doubt when we are sick, when we are bereaved, when we are experiencing financial difficulties, and when we have prayed and our prayers have not yet been answered. This is especially true when we know that God has the power to fix our broken situation. And for some reason, unbeknownst to us, God chooses not to or not when we want God to. But doubt is real. There are those who have experienced doubt. It is said of the literary genius Shakespeare that in times of despondency, he doubted whether he should be called a poet. The Italian painter and, and artist of the Renaissance high period Raphael doubted whether he should be called an artist. Moses doubted whether God could use him with his the, the, the stammering tongue. The children of Israel doubted whether the Lord was with them. Sarah doubted whether God could bring life to her barren womb at the age that she was. And when God tells you you're going to have a baby at Sarah's age, you don't go see your gynecologist, you go see your psychologist. And there is a man that we can barely call his name without saying doubt, and his name is Doubting Thomas. <laughs> doubt carries with it oftentimes a negative connotation, and so we often use euphemisms to carry out our doubts. Instead of calling it doubt, we call it something else. When we have doubts about the future, we don't call it doubt, we call it skepticism. When we have doubt about tomorrow, we don't have doubt, we don't call it doubt, we call it worry. When we have doubt as to whether someone can do something based on the pigmentation of their skin, we don't call it doubt, we call it racism. When we have doubts as to whether someone could achieve something because of their gender, we don't call it doubt, we call it sexism. When we have doubt as to whether there are any men, good men left, we don't call it doubt, sociologists call it misanthropy. And when we have doubts as to whether we still got it or not, we don't call it doubt, we call it a midlife crisis. Doubt is real, and doubt has taken hold of some very prominent and biblical characters. But in our text today, there is a preacher, a prophet, a man who has doubts, and his name is John the Baptist. John has doubts as to whether Jesus is who he says he is, and so he sends, as the earlier manuscripts tells us, two disciples to ask Christ, is he the one who should come, or do we look for another? 
John is, is battling and struggling and vacillated between doubt and faith. He, he is living in what the Old Testament retired scholar Walter Brueggemann calls the tension between theology and reality. He has doubts in faith. He has doubts as to whether Jesus who says he is who he is. But he also has faith because he has read the prophecy of Isaiah that one should come. And he would be the Messiah and there would be one who would prepare the way for the Lord's Messiah. But what makes John's doubt so interesting is that here is a man who walked with Jesus, who knew Jesus, who preached Jesus, who proclaimed Jesus, and was Jesus' first cousin, but now he has doubts. This is the same John who in Matthew chapter 3 verse 3 said, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his pathway straight, but he now has doubts. This is the same John in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 who witnessed the first Trinitarian gathering as he saw Jesus standing in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit landing on his shoulder in the form of a dove and God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This same John now has doubts. This is the same John who in John chapter 1 verse 29 held up his baptismal service and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But the same John now has doubts. This is the same John who in John chapter 3 verse 30 said, I don't mind riding shotgun with Jesus. He must increase, but I must decrease. But this same John now has doubts. The same John who supported Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who prepared the way for Jesus, now has doubts. But to understand John's doubts, you got to understand John's position. When John pronounced his doubts, John is in prison. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that John is in prison in the fortress of Machaerus. He has boldly and courageously denounced Herod the Great marrying his brother's wife. And he tells him in Mark 6 chapter 18 that it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And because of that, John now finds himself in prison. He didn't care that the great Herod, the powerful Herod, could take away his credentials, could ostracize him, could slander him. His name could take away his gospel license to the ministry, rescind his ordination papers, put him in prison and take his life. John didn't mind because John was not only a preacher, John was a prophet. And because being a prophet is risky business, John knew that it cost being a prophet. But being a prophet, he was bold and courageous. And the, one of the things we are missing in the church today is that there are lack of prophets. We got folk who call themselves prophets, but they rather spell it P-R-O-F-I-T than P-R-O-P-H-E-T. In fact, the church has literally become a non-profit organization because of the lack of prophets in the church. But being a prophet is risky business. It put Elijah in a cave. It put Daniel in a dungeon. It put Jeremiah in a pit. It got Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna burnt alive. Diedrich Bonhoeffer persecuted. Martin Luther King assassinated. Rosa Parks arrested. Frank Shuttlesworth housebound. Put Jesus on a cross and would get job ahead. But when you are a prophet, you got to stand on the word of God. You can't offer sermonic, sermonic snacks. You got to give people the whole gospel and truth. John was a prophet, and being a prophet is risky business. And John finds himself in prison. And maybe because of his position, maybe because of his predicament, John now has doubts. Jesus, are you the one? Or do we look or wait for another? For 700 years, the people of Jerusalem have been waiting for the Messiah to come. The anointed one, a deliverer who would, who would conquer all enemies, establish a greater kingdom, and usher in an era of hope, peace, prosperity, love, and joy. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, said that John would be the one who would prepare the way for the Lord's Messiah. And John went to work, running through the wilderness, preaching throughout Judea, and challenging all who would hear and to listen to him to repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
But after years of running and proclaiming Jesus, John has done his part. He has prepared the way. He has challenged the authorities. And he has pointed to another. However, after years of running and proclaiming Jesus, John now sees that not much has changed. At least not as John thought they would change. And he is perplexed now. He's trying to understand how it is that things are the way they are. And now he sits in a dark, damp, small dungeon with no words of encouragement from his first cousin, Jesus. He sits in this prison, and you got to understand John is an outdoor kind of person. John likes fresh movement and fresh space, and freedom of movement and fresh space and air. But now he sits in an underground dungeon with the walls slowly closing in on him. And in his loneliness, doubt creeps in and begins to eat away at him. And he begins to question, was Jesus who I thought he was? Was I suffering from a case of mistaken identity? Christ, are you the one? Or should we look for another? Understand that there are times when the preacher has doubts. When the ministry is not going the way you thought it would go. And when you cannot see the fruits of your labor being, being seen. And now you have doubts when, 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 when the people who are attacking you, you got to sit and stand Sunday after Sunday and preach to them. When you're trying to better the ministry and all you get is resistance from leaders who have chosen, who are supposed to be holding up your arms, but got them tied right now. It can cause you to have doubts when you want more for the people in the pew than they want for themselves it causes you to doubt when it seems as if you got to deal with conflict and criticism every week and folk you have married folk you've joined in holy matrimony folk you have buried their loved ones dedicated their children counseled and disciple them now leave your church to join the church down the street round the corner on the left hand side it can cause you to have doubts John's doubts are increasingly perplexing him because they do not, what was happening with Jesus does not correlate with what John has been prophesying. It's all right that Jesus has been healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out demons and calming storms and announcing the coming of the kingdom. But John wants to know. Where is the fulfillment of the prophecy? Where is the axe that's supposed to lay at the root of the tree and cut down unworthy trees? Where is the prophecy of the judgment or the fulfillment of the prophecy that he would burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire? John doesn't see any of this happening. The Romans are still in firm control. Herod and Herodias are living in comfort. It seems as if the religious right and, and authorities are just as arrogant and self-righteous as ever before. And John wants to know sends his disciples to ask Jesus with all this going on are you the one or should we look for another are you the Messiah are you Abraham's Jehovah Jireh are you Moses's Jehovah Nissi are you David's shepherd he shall not want are you Daniel's ancient of days Ezekiel's will in the middle of a will are you Solomon Rose of Sharon are you are you are you what Isaiah referred to wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace are you the Hebrew Shua Hamashiach or the Greeks Jesus Christos Koryos are you the one or should we look for another listen listen our our bad circumstances as preachers and pastors can reveal to us and what our faith is based upon they have the potential of revealing that our faith depends more on good circumstances we like to believe that our faith is based on the promises of God that come what may we should not be shaken and it should be but all it takes for some of us preachers is just to have a bad Sunday just to flunk one Sunday and we think God God has forgotten us or all hope is gone but when you are preaching and pastoring you need an unshakable faith you in the midst of doubt and uncertainty you need a unshakable faith an unshakable faith says that it will stand when everything else is uncrumbling around it an unshakable faith holds on when everybody else is letting go an unshakable faith stands when everybody else is leaning to the other side an unshakable faith continues when everybody
Nobody else wants to quit. An unshakable faith says, my trust is in the name of the Lord. And let me tell you, you don't have to tell anybody. You got an unshakable faith. The storms of life will prove whether your faith is unshakable or not. Jesus, are you the one? Or should we look for another? John, like John, we become weary. Weary and we long for the days when God's kingdom will come. Weary and longing for the days when there are no more shootings in our schools, on college campuses, and movie theaters, and sacred places when cancer will not leave an empty chair at the table anymore and people will no longer live in chattel slavery. We long for the day when, judge, when righteousness shall run down like water and like a forever flowing stream when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Christ and of his Lord and he shall reign forevermore. But right now we need to know Jesus are you the one or do we look for another and John John gets his answers because Jesus always has an answer in the midst of our doubts to go and tell John tell John that the blind receive their sight tell John that the deaf hear tell John that the dead are raised the lame walk the lepers are cleansed and the gospel is preached tell him there's a new fulfillment to the messianic rule tell him that I am who I said I am and just because where he is is in prison doesn't mean that the work in the ministry has stopped I am who I said I am tell John that the work in the ministry is still going on tell him that the deaf are hearing tell him that the dead are raised tell him that the lepers are cleansed tell him that the lame are raised tell him that the lame are here walking tell him that the lepers are cleansed tell him that the blind are receiving their sight tell him that the work in the ministry is still going on and I stop by to tell you preacher in the midst of your doubts when it's hard to stand Sunday after Sunday and you got to stand in front of people who are intentionally trying to hurt you don't doubt I hear the Lord saying that when your present situation threatens your future possibility, look to your past experience and know that the same God that brought you through before is the same God that will bring you through now. I hear the Lord saying before you doubt me, remember when you were sick, how I healed you. When you were down, I lifted you. When you couldn't see your way, I made a way. When your money was funny and your change was strange and your debit and credit wouldn't get it, I provide for all your needs. When your life was falling apart, I put it back together again. I bless you from A to Z. I have manifested myself to you. Don't doubt me because I've shown myself to you from beginning to end. In Genesis, I was your creator. In Exodus, I was your liberator. In Leviticus, I was your sacrifice. In Numbers, I guided you. In Deuteronomy, I remembered you. In Joshua, I was your commander. In Judges, I was your attorney. In Ruth, I was your redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I anointed you. In First and Second Kings, I crowned you. In First and Second Chronicles, I heard your prayer. In Ezra, I was your builder. In Nehemiah, I was your architect. Architect. And Esther, I was being sovereign. And Job, I healed your body. And Psalms, I was music to your soul. And Proverbs, I gave you wisdom. And Ecclesiastes, I gave you time. And Song of Solomon, I loved you. And Isaiah, I was your suffering servant. And Jeremiah, I wiped the tears from your eye. And Limitations, I strengthened you. And Ezekiel, I was your will in the middle of a will. And Daniel, I delivered you. And Hosea, I was your companion. And Joel, I was your judge. Judge. And Amos, I was your prophet. And Obadiah, I returned as your judge. And Jonah, I showed your patience. And Micah, I gave you mercy. And Nahum, I heard your cry. And Habakkuk, I answered your questions. And Zephaniah, I sustained you. And Haggai, I kept you. And Zechariah, I was your royal priest. And Malachi, I opened up the windows of heaven. Pulled you out a blessing you didn't think could receive. And then you thought that I was quiet for 400 years. But then I leaned on myself, uh, wrapped myself in human flesh, came 
came down 42 and some odd generations. And in Matthew, I was your king. And Mark, I was your servant. And Luke, I was the son of God, John. And John, I was the son of God. And Acts, I empowered you. And Romans, I justified you. And first of all, Corinthians, I gave you wisdom. And Galatians, I set you free. And Ephesians, I made you rich. And Philippians, I gave you joy. And Colossians, I made you complete. And first and second Thessalonians, I raptured you. And first and second Timothy, I instructed you. And Titus, I showed you grace. And Philemon, I forgave you. And Hebrews, I was your high priest. And James, I taught you about faith. And first and second Peter, I showed you salvation. And first and second and third John, I loved you. And Jude, I revealed myself of you. And guess what? In Revelation, I'm coming back for you. I am he who was, who is. There's no doubt about it. Is there anybody here know that Jesus is real? The reason I ask you is so many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. That is why I love him so. He's so real to me. In the morning, he's real. In the noonday, he's real. Late in the midnight, he's real. Oh, yes. He gives me the victory. So many people doubt it, but I can't live without him. That is why I love him so. He's so... is real to me. Victory! Oh. 
I'd be remiss if I did not extend an invitation. There's someone out in the congregation who has any doubt in their minds. You should be convinced tonight that Jesus is real. Amen. Let's give the messenger a hand for the message. Amen. 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 At this time, we're going to prepare to transition over for our communion service led by our president, Dr. Lynch. My God today. Now, I don't know, I don't know who else the sermon was for. I don't know who else got blessed. Thank you, Dr. Croft, for letting God use you. I'm going to ask Dr. Chris Davis, the president of our Tennessee Baptist Convention, who's visiting with us this week and teaching to join me in the pulpit to prepare to offer the blessing over the elements when we get to that point. These lights are bright. I thought I saw Pastor Robert McGowan come in. Is he still in here? Where's my, where's Doc? I need him to, either for him to make his way. Is he still back there? They point, but I can't see with these lights. Hear what I'm after. The blood will never lose its power. If, if they're gonna look to see if it's out in the in the hall, in the hallway, if not, I'm gonna ask Dr. Burrell to lead that when we get to that point. But deacons were passing out the elements when you came in. Was anyone omitted? If so, would you please raise your hand? The deacon ministry, this Macedonia Baptist Church, has been so kind. You raise your hand. The deacons are coming. There's some in the front. Keep your hand raised until they get there. They're working, they're coming now. As we prepare our hearts, I've always believed that it's important every now and then as a Baptist body for those of us who believe that sometimes we ought to join together in our faith and our worship as we celebrate what Christ did for us at Calvary. Our hymn of preparation, I've asked Dr. Cornelis to come lead us, oh hymn of the church, the old rugged cross. Now, some Ebenezer's here, and they can testify when I'm leading worship and we get to a hymn, we do all the verses. Because a, a hymn is like a sandwich, the meat's in the middle. <laughs> So she's going to lead us, and I'm going to come with our invitation to the table. Dr. Canellas.
Jesus. We Thank you, Jesus. invite you now to this celebration Thank you, Jesus. of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Early Christians, including Jesus, kept the Passover. Several things had to be done to celebrate the Passover. Every house in Jerusalem had to make these same preparations. First, to remove all leaven from the house. As a reminder that in Egypt, the bread didn't have time to rise. They had to cook in haste. But it was also believed that leaven was a symbol of corruption. The second thing that had to be done was to prepare the lamb for the meal, to celebrate that when the Jews left Egypt, God had to speak to Pharaoh and the last plague, the death angel was sent through Egypt to slay the firstborn of every home. But for the believers, God sent instructions Take a lamb, go to the temple, consecrate the lamb, come back, slay the lamb, and take the blood and smear on the doorpost of the house. So when the death angel would come down the street and came to a house covered by the blood, the death angel would pass over that house. The third thing they had to do, a bowl of salt water was placed on the table, which had two meanings, to represent the tears of the slaves and to represent the bitterness of the waters of the Red Sea that God divided when they crossed over. The fourth thing that had to be done, they were instructed to make a paste, bitter herbs, endive, horseradish, whorehound, and other herbs as a symbol of the bitterness of slavery. They made another paste, dates and apples and nuts and others as a symbol of the clay used to make bricks in Egypt. And then a plate with sticks of cinnamon on the table as a symbol of the straw they used to make the bricks. The fifth thing they had to do, four cups of wine, symbol of the four promises of God. I will make you my children. I will bring you out of Egypt. I will be with you. I will be your God. This ritual of preparation done in every house, every family in Jerusalem until God decided to make a change. It was Thursday not just any Thursday, it was that Thursday. The last full day in the life of our Lord. Thursday would be long, but Friday would be longer. Jesus, can you see Satan? Yes, he's got fiery darts in his hand. Jerusalem was filled to capacity with everyone that had come to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples were lodging in Bethany. 
but the law said that the Passover had to be celebrated inside the holy city. So when the disciples asked Jesus, it was not just a casual question, where shall we keep the Passover? They were not aware that Jesus had made preparations earlier with a friend in Jerusalem and had given the friend a password. Thursday morning, he woke up with a different look on his face, sent the disciples into the city, he said, there you'll find a man bearing a pitcher of water. When you see him, give him the password. What's the password? My time has now come. He'll show you a large room furnished. Go and there make ready. So today, we do not celebrate the Passover because God made a change. We celebrate the Lord's Supper because God decided he wanted us back. You see, in the Old Testament, the work of the high priest was never complete. The high priest on duty every year on the Day of Atonement had a specific assignment to go into the Holy of Holies and take the blood of a pure lamb without blemish. Recall now the temple in Jerusalem, the outer court where the people assembled, the inner court where the priests gathered, gather the holy of holies, the inner sanctuary where the very presence of God dwells. The veil separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temples. Scripture says that the veil was woven so thick that you couldn't tear it apart. If you hooked two oxen on each side, they couldn't tear. It was so thick. Behind the veil, the Holy of Holies, no one was allowed except the priest on duty. Ask King Uzziah when you get home. There was no seat for the priest to sit down. So when the priest went back, they tied a rope around him because if on duty, the priest had a heart attack and died, couldn't nobody get him, they'd have to pull him out. So the Ark of the Covenant was there. The pot of manna when the children were in Israel, Aaron's rod, the two tablets of stone written with the hand of God there in the Ark of the Covenant. Here in this assignment, the high priest was to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat made out of pure gold. The altar was there where the sacrificing took place. The work of the high priest was never completed. What the high priest did last year, he was going to do this year. And what the high priest did this year, he was going to do next year. After the act of atonement, the priest would come out and tell the people their sins had been atoned for only a year. He did this year in and year out. But God decided to make a change in the order of worship. God decided that he himself would be the final Passover lamb, the Paschal lamb, the lamb used in the sacrificing of the atonement of sacrifice by the priest was slain on the ground. So when Jesus died, the crucifixion crew has been at work. They've laid the cross on the ground. The, Jesus laid on the cross nails spikes driven into the skeletal frame. They did not know that they were on duty. Crucifixion, they would have dug a pit about two feet wide, about four feet deep. The cross would then be lifted and dropped in the pit facing the sun. They did not know what God was doing, that Jesus was being transformed from lamb to priest. And when they lifted up the cross, he was lamb lying down, but when he lifted the cross, he became priest standing up. Man in one hand and God 
hand in the other hand. He declared the fulfillment, I am the way, the truth, and the life for God to get man back home. So when he died, God was making a change in the present order. When Jesus died at Calvary, outside of Jerusalem on a skull-shaped hill, inside the temple, scripture says the veil was split from the top to the bottom. And when he finished dying, they buried him in Joseph's new tomb until he got up with all power. The Bible says he ascended unto the right hand of the Father and declared unto the world, I died one time, but won't have to die no more. One time, he shed his blood. One time, gave his life. One time, paid the price. One time, opened the door back to God. And here we sit tonight. 2,000 years later, here we sit tonight. The same question on the table. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but this blood of Jesus. What? can make us whole again, nothing but this blood of Jesus. The hymn writer said, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altar slain can give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of a nobler name, more richer blood than they. Here we are. One lamb, one death, once and for all. One lamb, one death, once for all humanity. One lamb, one death, once and for all. And we're here tonight because that blood will never lose its power. Thank <laughs> you. 
from day this bread or this wine so we appeal unto God Dr. Davis shall we pray here we are Lord a band of baptized believers with head and heart Turn toward Calvary. God, we have moved beyond the practices of convention and reflect now on the preciousness of conversion. God, we thank you tonight. As we come, O oh God, to this table, there are those, O oh God, who mistakenly think that salvation is free. 
but it cost you the most precious thing you had. Your only begotten son, oh God. So God, we come to the table tonight to remember, to recollect, to recall, oh God, just how much you loved us. God, it's bigger than just communion. It's bigger than sacrament or circumment, oh God. It's bigger than the Eucharist, oh God. But God, it's a tangible display of just how much you loved us. And for that, we tell you thank you. God, we ask tonight in the name of Jesus, search our hearts and search our minds, oh God. If you find anything that's unlike you, take it away. God, we want to be both right and righteous. We want to be whole and holy. Thank you now, God, that the blood has not, cannot, will not lose its power. We're better because of the blood. We're wiser because of the blood. But tonight we're thankful because of the blood. So now, great God, as we prepare to partake, God, as we partake of the bread, we remember the broken body. As we drink of the cup, we remember the shed blood. And because we remember, we tell you thank you. Bless now, great God, as only you can. It's in the precious name of the Christ that we do pray. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, as he sat with his disciples, Jesus took bread when he had given thanks, he broke the bread, declared this to be my body broken for you. Eat ye all of it. Likewise, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, declared this to be the cup of the new covenant, the cup of the new testament, my blood shed for you. Drink ye all of it. Amen. When they completed their last supper together, they sang a hymn of fellowship as they departed into the Mount of Olives. Our music ministry will lead us in our hymn of fellowship. I know it was the blood for me. After our after our hymn of fellowship, we will transition into our late night worship. Dr. Frank Thomas will come and preside as our guest preacher, Reverend Torian Walston, will also come. Please do not leave your cups on the floor, but the ushers will be at the back with waste baskets. Please be mindful. Keep this house clean like you would do yours. Amen. God bless you.